Hello everyone, this is Freename on YouTube with a video about this TP-Link Aginet or Aginet EX230V router. We're now sat at a computer, we're plugged into the router or in your case you might be connected to it via wireless and we can now bring up the web interface. The default IP address of the web admin interface is 192.168.0.1 and then press enter. It forces you the first time you visit it to set up a password. So if you've never visited the admin interface before, um, then it won't have a password set. Anytime somebody does visit it, it will then ask them to set a password. Once you've set a password, it asks you to log in. and we'll go through a setup wizard. Although I do have Google for Google, but I do have internet access. So without running the setup wizard, you still do get access to the internet if you are on just a, an ISP which uses DHCP. Interesting that this firmware has a no list of ISPs, just got other. Internet setup. I am on a dynamic IP. EWAN will be Ethernet WAN, and we can do VLANs if we need. In my instance, I'm just on dynamic IP on my test setup, but uh, a lot of UK internet providers will be using PPPoE. And that's where you'd fill in some uh, PPP username and passwords. Wireless settings, I'm just going to leave default. It can access the internet. Okay, great. Just gives me a summary of what it's going to set. It's already got my dynamic IP from my test setup and allows me to immediately set up VoIP. However, I will do that later on in the uh, video setup or maybe even a separate video on how to do VoIP on this router. You can associate it with a TP-Link cloud account. So I'm going to do that step later because I don't need to do it right now. You'll be able to do it in the web interface at a later date. Yeah, in fact, right there, left side, TP-Link cloud is where you would add that at a later date. So we are now in the web admin interface in the basic tab, and we're on the default page, which looks like it's a network map which has topology if you're using mesh networking. So there's lots of elements you can click on on this web interface. We can click on internet. It gives you details of the WAN connection. Click on main AP, which is where it had started and gives you the mesh setup. Click on wireless clients. It'll give you a list of wireless clients. I don't have anything connected over Wi-Fi and click on wired clients and it will give you a list of things that are connected, their IP address and what rate they're connected at. Telephone would work or show you details if we had a uh, VoIP account set up on here and there's nothing plugged into the USB thought. There's nothing plugged into the USB port. That's everything we can click on that network map screen. Let's go over to internet. It's the internet settings we've just seen in that wizard, basically the same PPPoE if you're on a uh, provider that's using the OpenReach network in the UK or possibly um, Box Broadband um, and some other some others. Can do LTTP and PPTP under wireless. It's what we've seen in the wizard, the name and the password and nothing else. You can click on share network and it gives you a little QR code. Not really sure what the tick box is. Let's do save picture. Ah, it's just whether the picture that you save has the QR code in it or not. 
and in fact I just noticed on this right hand side you could also turn off both or uh, either or guest networks you can tick that and turn on a network so that your guests can get out to the internet but they can't get to things like printers and uh, Chromecasts and other things on your network. Multi-SSID is like the guest network, but um, people will be able to get to everything on the network. So you could have, if you wanted to not have to reprogram all your smart speakers, uh, every time you changed your router or something, you could have a network called smart speakers or smart devices and then a password. It wouldn't segregate the traffic so your smart speakers could still speak to your uh, Chromecast or to your phones or whatever um, but it's just multiple network names for your one uh, internal network. Telephony which is where you can set up uh, SIP accounts or your VoIP provider so you click on add. It does have a list of providers doesn't look very UK centric though, so Sipgate, that's Germany, and some of these other ones, other names look very potentially German. I'm not sure if one and one was originally German. Uh, so we want to use other, just a generic provider, a SIP service, and I'm going to fill in. my SIP provider details it claims it's registered and the telephone light on the router has come on so we should be able to plug in a telephone and make or receive phone calls under telephony devices it shows the single phone port so they probably do variations of this device with multiple phone ports and you could define which port uses which SIP account. Or if you have multiple SIP accounts configured on this router, you can set which one is being used for the outbound calls. We've got enable VAD, which is voice activation detection. So um, when you're not speaking, the router stops sending audio, uh, which might save bandwidth. Also potentially would reduce the chance of echo on the line as well. And then you've got speaker gain and microphone gain in case your calls are too quiet or too loud or if you're too quiet or too loud to the other, to person at the other end or if you're getting echo you can try changing some of those settings. Onto USB sharing, I don't have anything plugged in but this is where you would configure it to access stuff from your USB drive that's plugged in and a 3G mobile dongle for backup internet. However, it's been quite a while since I've seen a USB dongle. Most things are just mobile routers or MiFi type devices. Having a USB connector on it, one is quite unusual. Parental controls. We can define a profile. We'll call this block children's internet and assign a device to it, which would be mine. Filter level, child. So that should be blocking uh, adult content and games. Well, let's find out. I want it to block all of, well, so time controls, is that blocking? Is that blocking the entire internet or is that just blocking those categories? I'm guessing that blocks the entire internet so um, I don't want to set a time limit or a bedtime so let's just do leave those blank and go save. Let's see whether we can get to gambling. Yes we can. Can we get to Yeah, we can definitely get to that. We shouldn't be able to. And we can definitely get to that website. So maybe I don't understand how the web filtering is supposed to work. 
nothing in the blocked history let's try editing it and if we do time controls and see I don't want to do this because if I do for example here and set that to something a time we've already passed 7 p.m then I just won't have any internet access as expected so um, let's try something that's really uh, should be allowed let's try Google yeah so that just the time section over here time controls blocks everything rather than just the categories during those times which is which is what you'd expect but what is not clear is why the so it's definitely assigned to my device because the time controls works but the filter level I'm set to child and adult content should be blocked games media social networking and everything should be blocked so filter content available categories um, so if I do games it moves it over to available categories move downloads over there save so that's definitely applied let's do Twitter ah so Twitter is blocked Facebook is blocked 888 which is gambling is not blocked and that should be covered presumably under games maybe and certainly that should be blocked under adult content you can't even allow it so that's definitely should be blocked um, what's another website that also should be blocked and isn't so something very wonky and I'm sure I've seen this with another TP link router in the past where some of the categories actually work like the social media ones and and other stuff which is very important to block like the adult content remains entirely accessible so Facebook now that works now I've set myself to uh, the team category but adult websites still work so be aware if you're using this router that certainly in my testing the adult blocking filter did not work and I've seen in the past I'm sure with other TP-Link routers the same flaw so um, there seems to be something quite strange there moving on TP-Link cloud this is where you would associate it with a logon on TP Link's website, uh, which will then probably let you log into the app and get to your router over the internet without having to be in the same network as your uh, as the router. The mesh system is where you can join other Easy Mesh supporting um, satellite devices onto this router, and they can be placed around your network and um, extend the coverage in more in, in a better way or more of a stable way than just a plain old Wi-Fi repeater or range extender the mesh stuff should be more stable um, most likely more performant um, and generally a lot better than power line networking or wireless repeaters or range extenders if I manage to find a compatible easy mesh device then have a look in the description of this video because there'll be a link to how you'd set one of those up um, and a demonstration of it working up at the top right of the web interface we can reboot the router remotely or upgrade the firmware of the router it does look like you can upgrade it online rather than having to be given a firmware file from TP-Link or your ISP so I'm going to click on check for upgrades and we'll see what that comes back with there is a newer firmware version and in the interest of checking the parental controls to see whether it solves the adult um, blocking category 
I shall apply this firmware update. Downloading and rebooting. So the power light is flashing green on the device. I still have network access through it. The power light is still flashing green and it's still allowing me internet access. And now the device is rebooted and obviously the internet has dropped as well. So the LAN is back and the internet is back. Let's see whether parental controls is solved. Uh, preteen, so it should block adult content and social media. Twitter is blocked, gambling is not blocked, and adult content is also still not blocked. So that's not something that got solved in the firmware upgrade. Moving on to the advanced tab, we have the advanced status screen, which has internet status, and at the top right of that panel you can change it to IPv6 status, which Interestingly, it hasn't picked up an IPv6 address when my internet does provide v6. So I'll have to look at that later. Wireless status for the 2.4, and again in the top right, you can click and change it to the 5 gigahertz. Scrolling down, we've got the LAN status, and again, top right, you can go between IPv4 and IPv6. Then performance for CPU load and memory usage. Clicking on network and then eWAN, which is Ethernet WAN for the WAN port in the entry for the WAN I'm using. We can click on edit and change further details. So this is probably why IPv6 isn't working. In fact, definitely because IPv6 is not enabled. So I will enable that in a moment. Let's have a quick look and see what tunnel allows you. So enable IPv6 automatic addressing type and let's see what we get under advanced we can also clone the MAC address or um, spoof a MAC address limit the MTU size enable or disable NAT enforce unicast DHCP which is interesting For specific DNS servers, so if you wanted to use OpenDNS or 8.8.8, uh, .8 Google DNS, etc., that's where you'd set your DNS servers. MLD proxy, which is to do with multicast proxying. And you can also force specific IPv6 DNS addresses. So I'm going to press OK on that. And I'm going to go back to the status page and we'll see if it's picked up IPv6. Weirdly it hasn't, so 
uh, just took some time. So uh, it now does have a V6 address and will be working. Moving on to the LAN settings, we have the LAN IP address of default 192.168.0.1 and the subnet mask, which has a drop down, but you can also set a custom subnet if you needed to. IGMP snooping, second IP address, which is an interesting option. So you could have it on a separate range for devices that I guess weren't do, weren't DHCP and can't really think of a use case for that. But anyway, DHCP server enabled or disabled and the range that it starts at and goes to, how long the lease is and what your DNS servers that you give to clients are. If you're wanting to use custom DNS servers that are out on the internet, like OpenDNS or Google's DNS, you do not want to set it here. You would do that under your EWAN settings and change it there so that the router is using Google DNS and the clients and your network are using the router. The reason you'd set it here is if you had a um, Active Directory server or a Pi hole doing advert blocking, then you'd want to give the clients on your network those devices or that device as the DNS server. Dual LAN setting, so probably useful if you have um, a static, a routed static IP range. I would have thought, and status for stuff that is connected. Interestingly, it sees stuff on the WAN side. So these things here are on the WAN side. Um, I'm not sure why it should be cataloging those. Possibly a software bug. So it's seen a DHCP request on my WAN side and it's recorded it in its database as as a device that it's seen, rather than going, oh, that's on the WAN, I don't want to display it in my web interface. Static IP address reservations, so if you needed to give a specific device the same IP address all the time. So my laptop, and I can go, I actually want it to be on 199 or whatever, uh, and it will always give out that IP address to that device. Dynamic DNS is useful if you don't have a static IP address from your router. Um, you can configure it to connect to the Dyn DNS provider and the host name will always follow your dynamic IP. This router supports TP-Link, which is probably free. Dyn DNS, which is not free. No IP, which currently is still free. And also looks like it supports um, some kind of custom update as well, where it will just send off a webhook or a request to uh, a Dyn DNS provider to, to update your record. Static routing, very little reason for me to go through this. If you know that you need static routing, you probably aren't watching this video to find out how that works. RIP, routing information protocol settings. Moving on to wireless, we have in the advanced wireless section, a lot more details than we did in the uh, basic section up here. We've got the name, the security type, which defaults to WPA2, and if we wanted to, we can enable WPA3 as well. Under advanced, you can set the channel to be something specific rather than something the router chooses itself automatically. You can also set the channel width. And the same for the 5 gigahertz, you can set the channel that it uses and the channel width. Moving on to the WPS option, you can enable or disable the WPS button on the top of the router. You can also enable WPS pin joining, although it's been a while since I've seen anything new have the ability to use a WPS pin. You can also trigger the WPS function without having to physically go to the router through the web interface. MAC address filtering is not worth using because it's pretty trivial to spoof MAC addresses. So if you're trying to block things connecting to your network or having an allow only list, then I wouldn't consider that to be a secure way of securing your network. Wireless schedule. So if you didn't want the wireless to be transmitting at night, you could use this so that it wouldn't be transmitting at specific times of the day or the night.
and indeed the wireless lights have just gone off on the front of the router. Now I've disabled the wireless schedule option, the wireless lights have come back on on the router. Statistics will show you stuff that's connected. So if you have phones or tablets connected or even laptops and computers, it will show you them in that list. Under advanced settings are a load of settings that you basically shouldn't change unless you know what you're doing with them. Uh, I've never in probably 15 or more years of doing wireless stuff. The only three which I have changed is AP isolation, airtime fairness and fast roaming. Um, airtime fairness will be good if you've got a, a router or an access point with lots of things connecting and you wanted to make sure that one client wasn't hogging all of the bandwidth, that's a good option to turn on. And otherwise, fast roaming can cause problems with devices. For example, there were for some, some Fujitsu laptops that were blue screen when I turned on fast roaming. Um, so there's a good reason that that isn't enabled by default. Multi-SSID, we've been through in the other screen, in the basic screen. And mesh, we've also been through in the basic screen. Guest network, same details or same screen that is under basic. And telephony, we do get a whole lot more than you do in the basic screen. So telephone number, under modify, you don't get anything additional, but you can enable IPv6, which for some unusual reason is not enabled by default, and in the advanced section we now have further, so advanced telephony telephone number under the advanced section under that. You can expand that out and change a lot of details to do with how it deals with DTMF and registration timers and um, other details to do with whether when you press hash it starts to dial automatically or basically like submits the, the call and um, It's forced to the UK, so I guess we've got a UK specific firmware or this device I've got has a default config on it, forcing it to the UK. Telephone book, if you wanted caller ID, you can fill in names and telephone numbers. And if you have a phone with a display on it, it would then show you those names as well as the telephone numbers. Emergency number. So it took me a while to figure this out. I did have to search the internet, which wasn't very easy on TP-Link's website because some of the documents he clicked on told me I needed to go to my regional TP-Link website rather than actually showing me the result in Google, which is quite annoying. Um, emergency number mode means that if somebody picks up the telephone and then doesn't press any buttons or dial anything, for example, for two seconds or eight seconds, it will then start dialing these numbers presumably in turn. So if you have somebody who is elderly or doesn't understand how to use a telephone, you can tell them just pick up the receiver, wait, and it will ring me. Uh, or pick up the receiver, wait, and it will ring your carer or um, some specific numbers. You could even have it, for example, a telephone sat in a, a call box with no numbers on the uh, that somebody, the member of public, could press on. So they can pick up the telephone and it could ring a taxi cab or it could, could ring any uh, number of your choice. Telephony device, we've been through that in the basic screen, doesn't give you anything further in here. Call log, if you'd made or received calls, will show there. Digit map is otherwise probably known as the dial plan, unless you know what you're doing probably leave that as is. Do not disturb hours. So you can stop people ringing through every day from 10 p.m. through to 8 a.m. Although that does look like it's got a flaw where you can't set the, the from time to uh, a time so you could do midnight through to 8 a.m. but then you couldn't do into the evening so that's a bit of a an oversight on their part very strange decision on there 
anyway, at least it's better than something. Uh, call blocking, you can add particular numbers to prevent you dialing out or them dialing in. Call forwarding, forward all calls or calls to specific accounts or calls to specific, uh, sorry, from specific people in your address book or from a specific telephone number and you can forward it on to uh, a different telephone number. So for example, if you had a family member that you did really wanted to speak to, you could select them from the address book or fill in their telephone number here and then have it forward onto your mobile number. Either if you don't answer or just unconditional, which means it forwards it immediately. And voicemail, which looks like it stores to the USB stick, which is uh, quite impressive. Be interesting to know what format that stores in. It's quite likely that I will have another video covering uh, the testing and use of this for telephone calls. So one of the things I'll probably test is how the uh, voicemail is stored on a memory stick. Moving on to NAT forwarding, we have application layer gateways, which are programs which run within the router, which will try and make uh, other protocols over the internet more reliable. Often these ALGs make things worse, and especially in the case of SIP, which is VoIP. If you find you have problems with VoIP, then untick the SIP ALG and save it. And especially if you have any other problems with any of these protocols like L2TP um, or IPsec VPNs, you might want to enable or disable the ALG. Virtual servers are port forwards. So if you're running a game server or a mail server or a web server inside your network, you'd use virtual servers. Service type gives you some templates. If I leave that blank and we'll do external port 443, internal IP. Oops, wrong IP range. Internal port I'm going to leave blank because I don't want it to translate to a different port enabled. And there we go. That's port forwarded port 443 in TCP through to the laptop that I'm testing on. Port triggering I've never used. I'm sure it has an application, but I'm not going to go through it here. DMZ is basically like port forwarding every single port through to a specific device, be that a computer or a game console. If you are using uh, DMZ and you, I mean, I really can't think of many reasons to use it. Basically, if you're using DMZ, it's probably because you've read advice on the internet or been told on a forum to enable DMZ through to your computer or to your game console to try and help people connect to your games. Um, that's a really terrible way of solving that problem. What you really need to do is find the accurate information on what ports to forward rather than just enabling DMZ, which opens up the internet through to that device or through to your computer. UPnP is universal plug and play which allows devices or software on your network or your computer to automatically configure port forwards. That's very useful for things like torrents or games uh, and game consoles. This will allow your game console to uh, open up the correct ports without you having to do it manually. But it also could be seen as a security issue because any software running on the console or your computer can open up uh, inbound ports for anyone to connect to. Multiple NAT, not got a clue what that does. Ah, it looks like if you have a multiple static IP range, it can do mass NAT translation uh, through into devices on your network. USB sharing for plugging a USB drive into your uh, router and having it share or be a, uh, essentially a NAS or a file server. By default it shares on FTP only on the LAN unless you tick FTP via internet which is probably a very bad idea to do that um, unless you have a, <laughs> a known reason to do that. You could do that as long as you're sure that you're using a secure password and you keep the firmware of the router up to date.
4G, 5G settings. If you plugged a mobile broadband device into the USB port on the back of the router, uh, as I said earlier in the video, it's very rare to see a USB 4G modem these days, so it's unlikely that anyone will use this, or if you are, then uh, you probably know what you're doing anyway. Parental controls, we've already been through, doesn't seem to work for at least blocking adult material. QoS seems to limit your upload bandwidth to whatever number you type in here. So if you're on a connection with really terrible upload and you didn't want games and other things to suffer by people saturating your upload, you can fill in, for example, I only want to allow something a maximum of um, 10 megabits. So I'll just quickly demonstrate without the option switched on. I'm able to get a download of one gigabit per second and an upload of one gigabit per second. If I go to the router, enable QoS, set it to uh, 15 megabits per second, and then rerun this speed test. It's limiting it to around about 15 megabits per second. So for games and for uh, VoIP and some other and online meetings, upload on your line is the most sensitive, generally, part of um, having a good service. So if somebody else on your network is uploading a backup or an iPhone is doing a backup or an iCloud upload, then it will potentially screw up your game or your call. Limiting the bandwidth to something that is lower than your line's maximum upload speed will improve that uh, experience for other devices. Plus, you can set devices to be higher priority or lower priority or middle priority. Under security, we can enable and disable the IPv4 and IPv6 firewall, enable denial of service protection, which probably doesn't really do a lot, doesn't stop anyone sending the data down your line, but it would mean that, for example, if somebody sends lots and lots of pings, instead of your router responding to every single one of them, it would either rate limit them or just stop responding. Service filtering will be blocking outbound access on specific ports to uh, or from things within your network. Access control is allowing and denying clients on your network by MAC address. As mentioned earlier when talking about Wi-Fi MAC address controls, MACs are not secure and are easily spoofed, so using or relying on MAC address for um, access control is not a great way to go about um, blocking or allowing things on your network. IP and MAC binding, not really sure what that means, that's possibly to do with ARP, and given that there's ARP further down uh, in the list, that is going to be forcing your router to send traffic for a specific IP to a specific MAC address. I can't really think of many applications for that because ARP should be doing its job and uh, filling those in automatically on the router. Uh, if something isn't replying to ARP, then there's probably not much business it being on your network. If you're lucky enough to have an internet provider that gives you IPv6 and you wanted to run a web server or a game or something on your IPv6 inside your network, then by default, the router is probably going to block any inbound requests because uh, having every device available on the internet is a bad idea. So you'd use the IPv6 firewall to allow specific ports through to one of the IPv6 LAN clients in your network. Under VPN and then open VPN, it can run what looks like several VPN server types. So you can have an open VPN server and this is where you configure it, generate a certificate and then put that into your OpenVPN config on your client computer so that when you're away from home you can connect in. 
a PPTP VPN server, an IPsec VPN server, and VPN connections will be the status of those that you've configured. And finally, system tools, LED control. So if you want the lights to not be on at night, if the router is in a bedroom, for example, then you can set what times the lights turn off and on. Diagnostics, let's have a go. Just gives you three simple tests, whether it can connect out to the internet, and then you can do some ping tests. Four transmitted, four received, and gives you the packet loss and the ping times. Traceroute does what Traceroute does. Seems to uh, be a quite acceptable diagnostic screen. Firmware upgrade we went through earlier in the video. Let's just check that it doesn't do incremental updates and it has actually gone to the latest. Yep, we are up to the latest firmware that they let you download. Back up and restore your settings. So if you needed to reset the router to test something, but then when you wanted to go back to your normal settings, you could just restore the config. Two different methods to factory reset the router. So if you're using TP-Link Cloud, then uh, you can use this restore and then you won't have to re-register the router to your account. Uh, or you can factory reset absolutely everything with the lowest button. Reboot schedule, this really bugs me that this is even an option on routers. There's no reason that you should need to reboot your router every day, every week or every month. It just screams to me that if there is this option, then the manufacturer isn't very confident in their stability of their firmware. And you can reboot the router remotely by using this button at the top of the screen. Under administration, you can change the password to log into the router to change settings. You can also turn on HTTPS for the web interface and remote web access into the web interface. By default, the router blocks ICMP ping, so it doesn't allow ping from the internet. I think that's a silly idea because it makes troubleshooting problems much more difficult. So under ICMP ping, you can enable remote. System log, just as you'd expect, the system log, lots of information about what the router is doing, which is better than no information about what the router is doing. Traffic statistics, let's turn that on and see what it does. just seems to count packets and bytes. So if you had a device on your network which was really chewing up uh, bandwidth, you could turn on traffic statistics and then see what's downloaded the most over, say, the last minute or 10 minutes or whatever. Port mirroring, if you wanted to find out or do a packet capture of what a device is doing on the network, you can enable port mirroring and then um, it will take any data received on the network and spit it out of whichever port you select here. Session timeouts is a really obscure and advanced setting for the router to uh, expose to you. It will be to do with the NAT state table and how long it keeps sessions in its record. Um, if you have a misbehaving bit of software that makes connections and then doesn't drop them but stops communicating or doing push and um, receiving and sending data over that connection, then by default it looks like those will expire after five days. Um, so if you have a misbehaving bit of software or a really high traffic network, then you might want to reduce that number. It does say in the documentation that if there's traffic through that session, then the counter uh, won't get applied. So if you're doing something like IRC for more than 
uh, five days and you're sending and receiving stuff over that TCP session, then it shouldn't get slayed after the five days. And that looks like it is the end of the router's web admin interface. Hopefully this video has been helpful to you. If it has, it would be really helpful to me if you wouldn't mind subscribing to my YouTube channel. You don't need to have the video notification switched on, but the subscriber numbers really do help. Thank you very much.